All right, so I've left you with a sample problem. And I wanted you to work through that sample problem and see if you could uh, come up with the answer. So the concentration of OH in a mystery solution is 10 to the minus 12. What is the solution's pH and what kind of solution is it? So before you answer, I want to make sure that you actually can take me through the process and give me the equations that you need to know and everything like that. Okay. So how many of you think you got a great answer? Okay. How many of you didn't even try to get the right answer? So what do I need to know? What's the first thing that I probably should do? What's the first thing y'all did? What's that? Say it louder, probably. Like the hydrogen smell. Like they got the eight. Okay. So I'm gonna determine my my concentration for the hydrogen, and I was. Can you can you give me that equation? Do you remember it? So great job on the quiz this morning, everybody. That'll count for ninety percent of your time on your <laughs> So the equation that you need to start with is the concentration of hydrogen times the concentration of the hydroxide ion equals 10 to the minus 14 molar square. And then from there, I can just begin to plug and chug, right? I can pop that in there, and I'm just going to set that to x, because that's my unknown. I'm trying to calculate the concentration of hydrogen. Let's step back. Let's do it step by step. So if I plug in my hydroxide there, this whole thing is going to read times 10 to the minus 12 plus 10 to the minus 14. Okay. When you, sub, uh, when you uh, divide by exponents, which is what you're going to need to do there, right? Just follow me some algebra. Over on this side, divide this side by minus 12. When you divide exponents, obviously that will cancel to 1. Over on this side, you subtract the exponent. So minus 14 minus a negative 12. I'm getting like four different, four different versions here. So 10 to the negative 2. Minus 14 minus the negative 12 is minus 2. Okay, so 10 to the negative 2. So this is the concentration of hydrogen. Okay? What would be the next equation? So pH equals minus the log of the concentration of hydrogen, which is this number right here. So this would be minus log of 10 to minus 2. This indicates that I'm worried about the exponent. Right? So I end up with minus or minus 2, which equals 2. So pH of our mystery solution, for example, 2 is going to be 2. And what kind of solution is it? That's acidic. Right? Does everybody feel 
somewhat comfortable with these concepts. Okay. Is there a question? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so before we leave the pH scale, because it is a log scale, it's not linear. Right, the linear scale would be uh, the, the change that we have in both directions is going to be equal along the curve. So if I go from one to two, that's a difference of one. Whereas on the log scale, if I go from one to two, it's actually a factor of ten, not a factor of ten. <laughs> so on a log scale, each whole number. Is an increase or a decrease by a factor of 10. So, for example, a pH of 10 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 6. How about the pH of 6 versus a pH of 4? pH of 4 is 100 times more acidic. A pH of 6 versus a pH of 3. Ten times ten times ten. Means I'm going to be three. I know you're asking the question. Oh. <laughs> Just to make a statement. It's really a question. What if I were to tell you that the uh, seismic, 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 seismic at the Richter scale that measures earthquake intensity was a log rhythmic scale as well? So a earthquake of five versus an earthquake of nine, ten thousand times more powerful. So it's not linear because right, if I were to go from four to five, it's a unit of one. Whereas here, it's now in, it's actually ten times stronger. So if someone challenges you to drink orange juice with a pH of 6, a battery acid with a pH of 2, and a battery acid with 10,000 times stronger, The big thing in biology that comes out of pH is going to be the idea of buffers. And whenever you hear the term buffer, regardless of discipline, a buffer is something that just simply prevents change. And I have a couple examples of buffers here. Buffers resist change. In terms of biology, we need to live at between a pH of 6 and 8, basically right around neutral. So if I start to deviate in either direction, it's going to be problematic. If I start to increase pH, 9, 10, 11, become more alkaline, it's going to cause problems with protein function. If I become more acidic, less, a lower pH, 5, 4, 3, it's going to become problematic. Proteins are going to begin to fall out of their shape and structure. So pH of 6 to 8 is one of those homeostatic variables that we must maintain. Now, your biological fluids, aqueous solutions inside and outside of the cell, <laughs> chemical reactions are occurring all the time. Those chemical reactions, a lot of them begin to change the pH. They begin to produce hydrogens or they reduce hydrogen, they steal hydrogens out of solution. So those chemical reactions are constantly putting this pressure to change the pH. 
but we got to resist that change because we must maintain our pH of 6 to 8. So the way we're going to do that is we have buffer systems in our biological fluids. So biological fluids have buffers. And really, a, bu a buffer is a system of two different chemicals that help to accept and donate hydrogen. So remember that we have strong acids and bases and weak acids and bases. Which do you think is going to be best for buffers? What is a strong acid do? I'm on silence. Yeah, so it completely dissociates and doesn't go back. Can you put that molecule back together? No, so it's irreversible, right? So if I'm trying to buffer by donating and reaccepting hydrogen, by allowing that hydrogen to move around dynamically, I probably don't want to put in some sort of acid that's going to completely dissociate and can't be put back together. So we're going to rely on weak acids and weak bases. So in our biological solutions, inside of our biological fluids, we put in bumps. And we basically use a weak acid in base combination. And really what happens is the weak acid will donate the hydrogen because that's what acids do. And as it donates the hydrogen, it becomes a weak base that can then accept a hydrogen. Alright? So here I have an unbuffered salt solution with sodium and chloride. And when I add my acid hydrochloric acid, Notice that I add another chlorine, but I also add a proton, and that proton stays free because it's a strong acid, so it completely dissociates. So what's happened now that I put the acid in here, what's happened to the acid of the biological fluid? What's happened to the, the uh, pH, I should say? Is that a hard question? Did the pH increase? You become more acidic and more basic. I felt more acidic than acidic. But the hydrogens are there. Remember, it's the concentration of the hydrogen that determines the acidity or the alkalinity of the solution. What's the what's the hydrogen concentration over here? <laughs> Zero. What's the hydrogen concentration over here? One. So hydrogen concentration has increased. If hydrogen concentration increases, what happens to pH? It decreases. You get closer to zero. Right? Because they're sort of inversely related. So this is not a good buffer because I've let it change. I now have a higher amount of acid or hydrogen in here because of the acid that I have. Now look at this system down here. And this is actually a common system that we're going to find in places like our bloodstream. You have uh, carbonic acid and bicarbonate. Carbonic acid is a weak acid, bicarbonate is a weak base. So I start out and I have my carbonic acid and I have my bicarbonate and I have a hydrogen. Okay? So what's the pH in here? We have one hydrogen, so we're going to say it's somewhat acidic. Let's say it's a pH of 6, just to put some numbers to it. I'm adding HCl. What's HCl? And it's a strong acid. It's going to dump that hydrogen off. So what should we expect to happen? pH is going to go down because hydrogen concentration goes up. But notice what happens as I put the hydrochloric acid in, that bicarbonate is going to accept the hydrogen. So it doesn't remain in solution and it gets converted into this thing called carbonic acid. So what's the pH over here? 
it's identical to what it was over here. I still have just that single H, right? Even though I put a bunch of hydrochloric acid in. So inside of your biological fluids, let's say inside of your cell, you begin to produce acids from a biochemical reaction. Maybe it's lactic acid that you're generating. If we don't buffer that, the hydrogen that's being produced by that acid constantly being released into the solution is going to slowly decrease the pH. We're going to become more and more acidic. But if we have a weak acid and a weak base present in that solution, they can accept the hydrogen and pull it out of the solution. And so it's no longer hydrogen. We've reduced or we prevented a massive change in our hydrogen concentration, and we can maintain our pH. Does that make sense? Are there any questions on pH on buffers? Would it be would it be good to do another pH problem or if we're good on that? Yeah. No, it's accepted the hydrogen. So it's kind of like if Devante here is a hydrogen on his own, you know, I reach out and I grab onto him and shake hands. We're now attached. And so he's no longer just a hydrogen, right? He's actually associated with another molecule. And because he's associated with another molecule, he's not having the same effect that the lone or individual hydrogen would have, right? So the buffer reaches out and grabs on to that hydrogen. <clears throat> It sequesters it out of the solution, keeps it out of the solution. And in the process, because I've added a hydrogen to a molecule here, my bicarbonate now has an extra hydrogen, I create a new molecule called carbonic acid. Okay? Make sense? So that's everything that I'm going to say on water. Now I want to shift to another important atom for biology for life, and that's going to be carbon. So you can start this over as a new lecture, uh, or a new, new, um, a new set of notes in your notebook. What's the uh, area of chemistry that deals with carbon? <laughs> Organic chemistry. So organic chemistry deals with the chemistry of carbon containing compounds. Now if you can summarize organic chemistry up in just a couple of words, it's that carbon is promiscuous and has lots of binding parts. It binds with all different types of molecules and it can bind in a variety of different ways. The binding characteristics of carbon, because it has up to four valence electrons that it can share across covalent bonds, means that we have a high degree of structural diversity. I have two hands, right? And that means I can hold the hands of two other individuals, or I can shake people's hands two, two at a time. If I was carbon, I could shake four people at one time. And so it's a higher level of interactions that can occur. So the body characteristics of carbon provide us with that high structure, structural diversity. And really, the high structural diversity comes from carbon's four valence electrons. The Four valence electrons that carbon has, that's just me the sign, I'm sorry. The four valence electrons that carbon has makes this a tetravalence molecule, or, or atom, I should say. Tetravalence just simply means tetra four valence valence electrons, or electrons that are available for producing a covalent bond. Tetravalence. Atoms like carbon, 
they will never lose or gain. And that means that they can't produce ionic bonds. Carbon and tetrabalance atoms can only share their valence electrons. So therefore only can participate in covalent bonds. No ionic bonds. Now, normally the tetrahedral structure is drawn flat, which is what you can see here. They're trying to re represent it a little bit differently here, um, showing the bond angles and that it actually has more of a three-dimensional shape, as you can see here in the space going in the ball and stick model. Um, so basically, what it comes down to is a tetravalence uh, atoms such as carbon is going to generate a tetrahedral structure. And within that tetrahedral structure, as you can see here from methane, you can have up to four hydrogens or four other molecules bound up on that single carbon through single covalent bonds. So we can put together up to four single covalent bonds. But we can also utilize double carbon bonds as well. I'm sorry, double covalent bonds as well. Even triple covalent bonds. So the point is that it doesn't just have to be single covalent bonds. We can add structural diversity by having covalent bonds that are double or even covalent bonds that are triple. Now, whenever we have something other than a single covalent bond, notice that the structure changes a little bit, right? Even though this is here methane, this is a tetrahedral structure. And here down here with ethane, we have a single covalent bond between the two carbons, and so there's going to be six hydrogen on this molecule. It still has a tetrahedral structure, right? You can see there's the three parts here, and then the top part is still tetrahedral in nature, bond angles and all that are going not really be that far off from this molecule here. So we still have that overall tetrahedral structure. But as we move towards carbon bonds that are covalent bonds that are double and covalent bonds that are triple, we begin to lose that covalent nature, that, that tetrahedral structure, that tetrahedral nature. I'm telling you all of this to let you know that when you change the shape of a molecule, such as going from the tetrahedral structure to the non-tetrahedral structure, you add additional function to, the, to those molecules. Okay, so we have all of these functions from a bunch of different tetrahedral molecules that we can produce, and then we have additional structures from the flat molecules that we can produce. So as you're looking at <clears throat> atoms and molecules and compounds, every time it looks a little bit different, it means there's a little bit different function. So just the covalent bonding characteristics of carbon alone produce massive amounts of function for those atoms. We're going to get to a point where we're going to start adding on chemical groups, and that's going to further add to the diversity. I mean, it's almost limitless the types of molecules and the functions of those molecules that can be produced. And that's why we can get this large array. We're going to start talking, hopefully, in the next couple of lectures about carbon based molecules that all function a little bit different. Carbohydrates are different than lipids, which are different than proteins, which are different than nucleic acids. 
And the function all comes down to the fact that they create this diverse diverseness and structure based off the covalent bonds that are produced by carbon. There is an organic chemistry building code. Um, in other words, there's sort of rules that when you're producing an organic molecule that are going to be followed. So carbon can associate with a variety of other molecules, and it associates frequently with oxygen, hydrogen, and nitrogen. Now, each of these have different number of valence electrons. For carbon, it's four. Hydrogen, Hydrogen is one valence, oxygen is two valence, and nitrogen is three valence electrons. And so when we're producing organic compounds, depending on how many valence electrons are available in the partnering atom is going to determine how the molecule associates in structure, and it's going to happen in different ways. So for example, since I have four covalent bonds with carbon, and two covalent bonds possible with oxygen, I typically will create double bonds with oxygen. Such as our carbon dioxide molecule here. And ultimately, what are we trying to do here with co producing covalent bonds? We're trying to take those valence electrons and add in a shared electron to get the valence, all the valence electrons paired up. So for both carbon and oxygen, I want to make sure that I have eight valence electrons in, associated with each of the atoms within the molecule. Um, can you explain B that you wrote there? So I'm just giving an example. And I'm saying if I have oxygen that has two valence electrons, when I share that those valence electrons with carbon, my tendency is to produce a double covalent bond with carbon. Whereas hydrogen, I only have one, and so hydrogen can only generate a single covalent bond. Carbon dioxide uh, is a source of carbon for our plant. Uh, for our planet, it's produced by photosynthesis. Animals indirectly use it because they're consumers. Um, it's the energy that's stored in these bonds that helps us to produce enough energy for us to continue to produce glucose. That's sort of a side note, but that's all right. So because of this organic chemistry building code, <coughs> We can generate a variety of different types of molecules. And we try to model those molecules in, in what are known as skeletons. Basically, it's the carbon with many molecules, single and double covalent bonds to the carbon molecules. And it forms basic skeletons, so to speak.
So from one carbon within a skeleton, we can hit, attach many molecules to a single covalent, a double covalent box. I mean, really, I think from a single carbon, I could add up to four different molecules. The other thing that I can do is I can actually strap carbons together. Just like I've done here. So here is a single carbon I can have up to four different molecules or atoms that can attach. Here I've added a carbon carbon bond. And now I go from just four hydrogens to a total of six hydrogens. And I could add additional carbons. And this becomes, as I bind carbon to carbon to carbon, it becomes carbon skeletons. And these carbon skeletons have a very high bonding potential. Very high bonding potential. Now, one of the most common molecules that, or one of the most common atoms rather, that binds up to carbon is going to be hydrogen. And it becomes so frequent that it's worthy of reference here. So, carbons. When they bond hydrogens, we have a molecule that is a hydrocarbon. Here's one example of a hydrocarbon, it's triglycerin. So what happens if I reduce a couple of these carbons? Let's say I remove them. I have a completely new molecule. Completely different molecule than what I'm here. Add some carbons on. It's a different molecule. Take some of the carbons and put them into a ring. It's a different molecule. So the basic skeletal structure, there's a wide variety of different skeletal structures because carbon can bind so many individual atoms all at one time through up to four valence electrons. Now, even in terms of portions of molecules, with hydrogens and carbons, we can have hydrocarbon regions. And so as we begin to build the molecule like this, if you go from carbon now to hydrocarbons to now molecules that have regions of hydrocarbons, I'm now beginning to have regions of molecules that act differently. So for example, if I take fats that have a non-hydrocarbon region called a head and hydrocarbon tails, I have a head that interacts well with water and tails that don't interact well with water, all in the same molecule and become the basis for producing biological molecules. Everybody kind of get the point of what I'm doing here? Every time we alter something within a molecule, the number of carbons, the molecules and, 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 and groups that are bound to those to those carbons, we change the carbon. And I mean, the the, the imagination is, is is what limits the different types of carbon-based molecules that can be generated. Does that say hydrocarbon tails? Yeah, hydrocarbon tails. This should be about hydrocarbon HC. Sorry about that. Not hydrocarbon head and a hydrocarbon tail. So in other words, my head, the head of the molecule doesn't have regions of hydrocarbons. The tails have regions of hydrocarbons. Makes it a polar molecule. We've discussed that term before. It becomes the basis for producing membranes. C6H12O6, it's glucose, right? But it's also fructose. And it's also galactose. And it's also lactose. So not only can we have carbons and hydrogens and oxygens at certain ratios, but we can organize where the bonds are and how the 
molecules bond together and we can add additional diversity by having isomers. The same chemical structure, or uh, I'm sorry, molecular formula, but different geometric structure, different physical structure, making it act differently. So an isomer is a molecule that's the same formula, but a different physical structure, which means different biological or physiological uh, function. So I gave an uh, example here, glucose and galactose. You count up all the carbons, hydrogen, and oxygen, they're the same number. But notice here, in the 1, 2, 3, 4th carbon, in both molecules, the hydrogen and the hydroxyl group are switched. That one little change makes these two biologically unique molecules, even though they have the exact same structural formula. Same formula, different structure. So different properties. Uh, an example I could give, uh, fructose, same here as glucose, galactose, fructose has the same formula, but it's a different structure. Glucose can be utilized as the starting point for glycolysis, fructose cannot. Fructose can be added in a another part of the glycolytic pathway right? because they're different properties. Now, in terms of isomers, there are three different types of isomers. In those three types, one is going to be a structural isomer. And the structural is going to have <laughs> different differences in the covalent bonds that are produced. So here we have ethanol, which is also called alcohol. You can see that I have one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens, two carbons, and a single oxygen. Over here with dimethyl ether, I have one, two, three, four, five, six hydrogens, single oxygen, and two carbons. Structurally, they're different though, right? I moved the hydrogen or I'm sorry, the oxygen, uh, and put that into the second position. That means those two molecules, even though they have the same formula, structurally they're different, and they have different physical properties. We can also have geometric isomers. where the bonding skeleton is the same, but the atoms are just the atoms have altered distribution. So here you have trans and cis folic acid. This is a type of fat. And right here, you get the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, ninth carbon on both of them. The way that that bond is formed allows there to either be a straight or trans structure versus a cis structure where we have that bend. There's really no difference here in the formula, the, the uh, formula, or really the structure. We've just changed how those atoms are distributed in how they share their electrons to put in that, that cis branch or that, that kink in the fat. In the last type of isomer is called an enantiomer. These are going to be near images. Okay? So here we have alanine, and you can see that I have hydrogens, carbons, and then I have my amine group and my carboxyl group, and then my CH3. 
can I have a D version of the molecule? And then a mirror image, which is the L version of L. Okay? So this, I can't take this molecule and put it on there and get it to line up exactly on top of this other molecule. So structurally, they're, they're mirror images of each other. And this creates handedness. You have a left and a half, you have a right, left and right versions of that molecule. And for the most part in biology, only one is going to be biologically active, the other will be inactive. So if you consume L alanine, it's probably not going to be incorporated in any proteins. You have to consume D alanine for it to be incorporated in the proteins and have a biological activity. Now that's not to say that that's a hard and fast rule, but in general, one of the pairs of the enantiomer is going to have biological function. Everybody get one thing that I'm going to require you to take a look at is the IUPAC convention. The IUPAC convention is the nomenclature for organic compounds. And it gives you the, the rules for how to name them. You know, things like what carbon has what functional group on it. It's the fourth carbon with an alcohol group. You get 4-OL in the middle of the name. So testosterone actually has a slightly different name than this testosterone. But you can go and look up that organic molecule and figure out what the actual name should be. So just be familiar with that. Things like pro PROP, propane, it references the number of carbons that are present in the molecule. One additional way to cause uh, more function and variability, more physiological capability by adding functional groups. Here's a list of some of the more important functional groups that will show up in biology. You've probably done these before uh, in chemistry, or you will shortly if you have not yet. In a functional group, it's going to act the same regardless of what atom it's bound to. So in other words, I can take the same carbon skeleton and I could add different functional groups and I'm going to get different function because those functional groups are acting the same for the same <laughs> functional group but different function if I'm adding different functional groups in the carbon skeleton. Different functional groups on the same carbon skeleton leading to different functions. There are five there, and I'd like you to be aware of six functional groups that are pretty common in biological systems. For biology and life. First one is that hydroxyl group. It's just simply an O and an H, an oxygen and a hydrogen.
when you attach a hydroxyl group to a carbon skeleton, we call that molecule or that carbon skeleton an alcohol. So when we have OH present in our molecule, which is CBOH, you know that part of that's an alcohol. The next group is the carbonyl group. And what you can see there, the carbonyl group is basically carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Now that particular molecule can end up in two different locations within a carbon skeleton. It can end up near the end of a linear carbon skeleton. When it is at the end of the carbon skeleton, we call that aldehyde. So if it's a sugar, we designate sugars with O S E at the end of the group, uh, end of the name, like glucose, fructose. If you have the carbonyl group on the first or the sixth carbon of a sugar, the beginning or the end, I guess you would say, at either end of the molecule, then becomes an aldehyde, and we would call that something like an aldose, indicating that it's a carbonyl group at the end of the at the end of the carbon skeleton, and it's a sugar, so OS and aldose. If it's within the skeleton, this is called a ketone. So sugars that have the carbonyl group in the middle of the structure are ketose. We're going to run into those terms. Aldose and ketose referring to the position of the carbonyl group within, within the structure. The next is a carboxyl group, and really the carboxyl group is a combination of the hydroxyl and the carbonyl group, hence its name. Carbol OXL from the hydroxyl group. So if we have a carboxyl group, carbohydroxyl and carbonyl group, we have a carboxyl group. And that carboxyl group can come in two different forms. It can come in a non-ionized form. In the non-ionized form, which is what you can see here, it's going to have no charge, and it's basically being because of the hydrogen. The hydrogen is covering up the charge. Remember, hydrogen is really a proton. It's a nuclear. It's a uh, proton and an electron. And so if you pull off the hydrogen, we leave the electron behind. We get the positively charged hydrogen proton, and then the, carbon, the carboxyl group will become negatively charged until that's its ionized form. And then it's our ionized form. The carboxyl group can act as a source for hydrogen. The oxygen is going to steal the hydrogen's electron. Why is that? Anyone happy to remember? The hydrogen, if we ionize the carboxyl group, the electron, the oxygen steals the electron from the hydrogen. Yeah, the oxygen is much higher electronegativity. So because it acts as a source of hydrogen after the oxygen steals the electron, drops off that proton, and it has a negative charge. <laughs> When the carbon skeleton is 
associated with a carboxyl group. We're going to call it, shoot surprise you that we're going to call it carboxyl, carboxylic acid. It's an acid because it can go into hydrogen range. That's what acids do. So this is going to be a carboxylic acid. The amino group am I out of time? You want to just stay? We'll pick up with the amino group on uh, on Friday.